The NTSB released more photos to us the other day of the January 31st, 2025 Learjet 55 medevac crash that took place in Philadelphia. You might remember we showed you all that and gave you a couple of other videos with some analysis on it before this one. And we're going to show you all of the pictures that they showed us here on the cockpit voice recorder. And we're going to discuss and prove to you whether or not it was legally required to have the cockpit voice recorder. Because a lot of people are split down the middle on this one as to whether it's really required. The CVR did not record the accident flight. And during the audition, it was determined that the CVR had likely not been recording audio for several years. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh my gosh, man, I am now in a state of shock. I'm angry. My blood is boiling because this should not have happened. So anyway, as you know, we always get a lot of trolls here on the channel. And so some of them were commenting on the previous video I uploaded here about the preliminary report that the NTSB mentioned. And I said there was some shocking news on there. And of course, the shocking news was that we were all expecting to hear what was on the cockpit voice recorder. And they said there was nothing there because it hadn't been operated in a few years. So that was the shocking part. And of course, some of these trolls come in and go, oh, it's clickbait. There was nothing shocking here. And then you're going to see them all one by one coming in and saying that wasn't required by law to have a cockpit voice recorder. And I'm like, hmm, where did you get the evidence for your statements to say that? I, as an engineer, will go and look. So since a lot of people are in contention over this, let's go ahead and solve this right now, once and for all. We're going to take a look at the code here, the federal code, and we're going to determine whether or not this air ambulance was required to have a cockpit voice recorder. And unlike some of these other people that just come in and shooting at the hip and don't have any evidence, we're going to show you the evidence. So like I showed you last week here on the NTSB's investigation preliminary report into the Philly midjet plane crash, here's what they're telling us. The airplane was operated as a Title 14 Code of Federal Regulations Part 129 Air Ambulance Flight. And then when you go to the bottom of their report, they also show you here in the summary table right here. I see there's the operator midjets SA. And it says Foreign Air Carrier 129. So this is the code that it would fall under. So this is our good old congressional code. This is the Code of Federal Regulations. And of course, under Title 14 right here, Chapter 1, Subchapter J, Part 129. That's what they're talking about. Remember that? Part 129. So it says right here, it's operations, foreign air carriers and foreign operators of U.S. registered aircraft engaged in common. So the question is, we know that this Medjet is licensed and registered in Mexico, but does that mean it's registered in the U.S.? But anyway, if we go down to the rules here covering cockpit voice recorders here under 129, which is where the NDSB claims that they belong, and um, let's go right here, it's under 24. So it's it's under section 129.24, cockpit voice recorders. And it says right here in this section, no person may operate an aircraft under this part that is registered in the United States unless it is equipped with an approved cockpit voice recorder that meets the standards of blah, 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 or later revision. The cockpit voice recorder must record the information that would be required to be recorded if the aircraft were operated under part 121, 125, or, one, or 135. It falls under 135. And it must be installed by the compliance times required by that part as applicable to the aircraft. However, the air ambulance company here is throwing a little monkey wrench into the gears here because check out what they say on their website. When you go to Jet Rescue's website, there's their lovely planes there. And you go to the very bottom and you look at the fine print. It says right down here, Medjets SA operating as Jet Rescue owns and operates its air ambulance fleet under Mexico, blah, blah, blah. So these planes are registered in Mexico. They are not registered in the United States. Otherwise, I think they would have said they were, right? And there's a reason why they want to do that, so that they don't have to conform to a lot of the rules. And in fact, it says here that MedJets USA is an indirect air carrier authorized under Department of Transportation order, blah, blah, blah. And that's the Civil Air Board 
uh, rulings there. And here's the kicker right here. It says it uses the services of licensed FAA Part 135 direct air carriers for foreign equivalent carriers to meet the air ambulance needs and transportation of their clients. It says right here, MedJets USA does not operate any aircraft as an indirect carrier. Okay, it says MedJets contracts for the provision of air transportation services in its own name and coordinates the provision of medical services. All flights are operated by licensed direct air carriers. So does this sound confusing to you? The company based in the U.S., okay, but... They own the planes, but they're registered in Mexico. They even said 135 on their website. So who's right and who's wrong here? Well, we don't know. But if you are still confused about this whole mumbo jumbo, like what is what is this indirect and direct? Think of Uber. Uber is not a taxi company. Uber is a software platform, right? And they use contractors to do their driving. So those are sort of, think of them as indirect, right? So Uber doesn't directly employ these people. They are indirectly paying them to drive you around there. So it's, it's very similar to that. Okay, so anyway, getting back to the code here, in 135, remember, we're saying operating requirements of commuter and demand operations and rules governing persons on board such aircraft. And here, under cockpit voice recorders, it says no person may operate a multi-engine turbine-powered airplane or rotorcraft having a passenger seating configuration of six or more for which two pilots are required by certification or operating rules unless it is equipped with an approved cockpit voice recorder that blah, 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 does all that stuff. So you can see right here in the code, section 135.151 says cockpit voice recorders are required. And here it doesn't really specify whether it's registered in the U.S. or not. It just simply blanket requires it. Hmm. You know, so it just seems to me that whether you're covered under part 129 or or part 135, it seems the spirit of the law in both of these want that cockpit voice recorder to be there. And whether they are whether they miss something, whether we're falling through the cracks here with this mid-jet plane that's registered in Mexico, who knows? But certainly, if you're flying any plane in the United States commercially like this, and paying passengers are paying you to fly them, I think you should have a cockpit voice recorder on there. I mean, I mean for Pete's sake, people, really? City buses have dash cams on them. You have, you've seen accident videos all the time where you can see showing the bus driver and everything. You can see everything that's going on in there. Why don't planes have that? Why can't you put a tiny little dash cam there in an airplane and just record the whole thing on video and audio? It's just so unbelievable how backwards we are with airplanes that we're decades behind what we have in our cars. I can put a camera on my car, a backup camera that shows up what's going on behind me when I back up. This kind of stuff should just be required by law. And I think it is required by law. And I think some people are misinterpreting this law. So anyway, coming back here to 129.24, which is the cockpit voice recorders. Again, this verbiage just seems very strange, confusing, and that it's contradicting itself here because it is saying no person may operate an aircraft that is registered in the United States unless it's equipped with a cockpit voice recorder, okay? But the aircraft is not registered in the United States. I mean, hello, it says XA right there on the tail, and we all know what that means, XA on the tail of this midget means that it is licensed and registered there in Mexico. So they are a foreign entity. They are a foreign carrier flying people in the United States. So it seems like they should conform to section 129, right? But yet when we come back here to 129.24, it seems like the code itself is trying to shoot itself in the foot that no person may operate an aircraft under this part that is registered in the United States. So when you come back up to the top and look at what 129 is, it's foreign air carriers and foreign operators of U.S. registered aircraft. So there is sort of the ambiguity there. We have to really determine. I don't think they gave us enough information. I would like to see the actual certificate because they're claiming 129 here, whereas MedJet themselves on their own website are claiming 
Clark 135 right here. So let us know down in the comments below what you think is the real case here. But either way, it looks like whether they're under 129 or 135, the spirit of the law says that a cockpit voice recorder should be... Pro okay, so I went digging into the deep, darkest history of the MedJets company, and here's where they applied to the Department of Transportation here back in 2018 to get here, right there, see that? The exemption in foreign air carrier permit. So that is what we were talking about that we wanted to see. And then when you look at this, so this is their application. And when we scroll down here to page four of it, Look what we're seeing right here. It says, to do so, the applicant requires DOT exemption permit authority and subsequently intends to apply for Part 129 operations specifications from the FAA. So here they are declaring that they are going to fall under Section 129. What I don't understand, though, still is why here at the bottom of their website are they declaring FAA Part 135. Something's not jiving, and it's probably this here on their website that's wrong and that will have to probably or should be restated unless they've changed their status since they got this application in. And then I also found here the actual approval from the Department of Transportation. So here it is right up at the top here, United States Department of Transportation. And this happened here on the 20th day of May, 2019. And the final order says right here, accordingly, we make final our findings and conclusions as stated in the order and award to MedJets the foreign air carrier permit with associated conditions attached to the order. So there you have it. So they got their approval here in July of 2019. So why are we spending so much time looking at this? Because it is so important, so critical here in determining the culpability as to why the cockpit voice recorder wasn't used when it is indeed required, according to my interpretation of what we just read in the law, even though a lot of people kept sending me comments saying, no, it is not required. And I can't imagine any condition where it would not be required because it says it right here. It says right here, you know, no, no person may operate an aircraft under this part if it's not equipped with an approved cockpit voice recorder. Tells you that right there, they are bound to this. So this right here should send a warning shot across the bow of all of these foreign carriers too, as to, hey, are you checking your cockpit voice recorders? Are they working? You have it in the plane. Why not test it? And why isn't it working? You have a simple test button right there at your controls. Why aren't you using it? Because without this cockpit voice recording, we'll never know what they were talking about here on this flight as it was going down. You you might have heard them say, oh, the captain just had a heart attack, or who knows, maybe one of the passengers went berserk and attacked the captain. I mean, there's a million things that could have gone on, and we will never know what it is. They may have lost control of the ailerons. Something might have busted. We'll never know now. But anyway, I'll tell you something else too because this is just the mind-blowing part right here, because right next to the cockpit there, the captain has a test button. Why didn't they test it? So here I'm looking at a Lear 55 checklist, and assuming that this is the same one that they used, we don't know, but let's just take a look. Um, it can't be that far off from what they had. So this is what they do at their start. Here's everything they check for, and I don't see anything on here checking the cockpit voice recorder here. And same during when they're taxiing, here's their checklist, right? And same thing when they're on hold, and when they line up, and then after takeoff, and climb. I mean, you would think that before the flight, this is where it would take place if they check it. And so what's really strange about this is the fact that they're not checking it. And that is not even a place in the checklist. You would think that that would be an item that is there and checked. So those of you who are pilots, hey, let us know in the comments below whether you have anything on any of your checklists that tell you to check the cockpit voice recorder. And yes, folks, there is indeed a way to check it because this right here is a picture I found on eBay where somebody is selling a cockpit voice recorder. Um, this is the, the control module that goes right there in the cockpit next to the captain. And you can see right there, there's a CVR test button. There's also an erase button, but certainly you can test the cockpit voice recorder by pushing this button. So to me, anybody is without excuse as to why this thing went three years without being used unless it was broken. But even then, the first time somebody did a test, it should have been discovered. And what about when they bring it in for maintenance? 
shouldn't maintenance have checked that? Isn't this a common checklist item for maintenance people to look at and fix if it's broken? So here's the backside view of it. So you got right here, the push buttons send the signal here through the harness over to, over to the cockpit voice recorder and tell it to do its thing. And then of course, here's another angle of it. There's where it plugs in to the main harness. So looking at this here, it seems to me like it's a very easy test to find out if your cockpit voice recorder is operating or not. So I want to start off here by showing you some new photos that the NTSB released the other day of just exactly the condition that the cockpit voice recorder was in here from the Philly midjet crash. So you can see it right here, nice and close up and high powered resolution there. I mean, it had some damage to it, but these cockpit voice recorders always somehow end up to survive, even when there's water intrusion like this one had. So here's one of the engineers there at the NTSB displaying it, both sides of it. And this is my favorite photo of all because I love these tools. So here he's using a Craftsman angle grinder, and I'm surprised he's using a corded one because by now all of my tools are corded. I use a DeWalt FlexVolt 60 volt. It takes a 60 volt FlexVolt battery in order to, uh, you know, for the angle grinder. So anyway, that's fine. If he wants to use a corded, that's perfectly fine. I also own this exact tool right here. So glad to see somebody else has it. So this is Milwaukee's three inch cutoff tool. So this has a smaller blade to get you into these tighter areas. And I love using this thing. I use it to cut off everything from like pipes, closet wire shelving, if I ever install any of that when I'm doing some of my remodels and my flip condos. So this here is an M12 version of the fuel. This is a brushless tool and it takes the small M12 batteries from Milwaukee. So he's using some good tools to get into this sucker and he's going to need them. Here you can see the sparks flying from the angle grinder. However, he is using the wrong type of goggles. Okay, so after he's used the angle grinder to slice the top open, now they're going to look at getting the guts out of there. And so this is the protective housing that it's in. And it's so funny how much I know tools because I'm looking at this. And if you, if you guys are like me and you see your favorite tools being used, you only need to see part of it to know. This looks like an Irwin utility knife. So you guys let me know that, that looks like their blue kind of rubber color that they have on them. But anyway, he's using it to slice off this lid here to get inside at the guts. Okay, now he's got the part out. This is the, the main unit that houses where the tape is that holds the, I believe it's 30 minutes of recording time. And then here, the engineer exposes the innards and the tape is wound up inside here. So now they have to get that out. You can see it's wet inside. So there was a lot of liquid intrusion. It's not a problem for these guys. They know how to deal with this. They deal with it all the time. So then they take the reel of the tape out of there and they soak it in the water. This is probably ionized water or maybe there might be some alcohol in there too. I don't know. But they use that to clean off the tape. And because remember, it came in wet. They usually fill them in a cooler with water when they bring them in anyway, to, you know, to transport them to their lab. They already have it filled with water as well. Because if it's wet, it has to stay wet until these guys get their hands on it. So that's what they're doing here. They're getting it, uh, rinsing it off, cleaning it, and they are going to let it dry off. And then they'll pull the data off of it. And of course, we know what they pulled off of it. It wasn't anything recent. They said it was a few years old. By the way, if you missed the initial video that I did last week here on the NTSB's preliminary report, you can view that right over here. You can see my other video. The NTSB came out with a preliminary video for the Washington, D.C. American Airlines crash with the Black Hawk helicopter. So you can check that one out as well. So thank you for joining us, and we'll see all of you on the next one.